unmute myself. Yes, yes. Hello, everybody. So glad that uh, you're here and we're doing this in Idaho today. Um, my name is Muffet Jones, and I teach in the, um, uh, I am an art historian. And so I'm responsible for the foundational program here at BSU in um, the visual arts. Um, and we, uh, this, this program has been um, around for, for quite a long time. It's been part of the, part of the uh, arts foundation along with music and, and theater, um, but it had been a pretty ad hoc kind of uh, program until um, I took it took it over as as director some, some oh golly I don't even know more than five years ago I guess and um, so we've tried to make sure that the the students all receive uh, it's a it's a high enrollment course um, we generally have at least three to four and sometimes five sections per semester. And generally in each, some, in each uh, cohort we have in the face-to-face -face and in some of the online now that we're, we've, we've done, I have 150 students each. So literally in, in this particular program, we teach over uh, 500 students every semester. So it's it's fairly significant in in, in terms of its um, uh, the number of students that we reach. Uh, obviously, most of those students are freshmen because this fulfills uh, a requirement for them, and um, many of them then will be uh, not just freshmen, but here in Idaho. Uh, we have a lot of first gen students. We've got a lot of students from different populations, a fair amount of diversity in this particular uh, course. Um, and so there have been a lot of, of issues to think about. Um, I have been, I created an OER text uh, in 2017, I think, 17, 18. Um, and uh, it, I will talk more about how I did it and why I did it uh, in our next go round. Um, but that's what I did. So we've been using that with all of the um, uh, sections now for uh, at least three, four years. Um, so we have some pretty good uh, feedback, basically. We have a pretty good idea of how this works for us now. So that's me. Um, Bob, I will give, I will hand it back to you. Feel like a news presenter. Back to you, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, we'll go with Teresa uh, next. Great, thank you, Bob. I'm Teresa Foka Relay. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the interim administrative director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Boise State, uh, but I'm also an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Theater, Film, and Creative Writing. And it's um, with that hat on that I have developed along with Monica Brown in our eCampus Center, uh, an OER uh, play anthology for my theater history course. Uh, so that's what I will be talking about today. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Keith, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Keith Anderson and I work for the TRIO program at Boise State University right now. I taught at Boise State as an adjunct for uh, 18 years, different topics, human communication. Uh, I taught uh, a course on racism that I developed and I taught sociology of racism uh, over the years. Uh, and I wrote a book on anti-racism and that's why I'm here to talk about how that all came about. All right, great. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, so um, as the uh, discussion continues, um, if you are so inclined, if you have questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat and I will try and get to them. Um, and then um, that way the speakers can be, feel a little freedom not to monitor the chat the whole time, but I'll catch that for them. And so we're gonna go back to start with Muffet. And she did touch on this a little bit, but um, Muffet, would you mind talking about more of the, why the book was created? What student population were you concerned with? And um, if there's anything else you'd like to share about what you've learned about uh, the book and OER process. Sure. Uh, well, as I say, I, I had been teaching this for some, um, uh, a few years, 
um, before I decided to write the OER text. And I've been using a couple of different textbooks. Uh, art uh, 100 is essentially an art appreciation course since it's open you know, to students from all disciplines. Um, uh, and so we, uh, I, I had found all of those textbooks to be, to cover the material in largely the same way. Um, I didn't hate them, but it seemed for this particular course for our school here um, that to ask students to buy a hundred dollar textbook for a course that they might not, you know, certainly coming into it, don't have a particular interest in and don't anticipate ever, you know, using that textbook probably again. And while you can always resell it, you don't get your money back. So. Um, my thought, once I found out about OER, which I did through Bob and the, and the university, um, was that this would be a terrific uh, sort of resource to have for this particular class since it had such a high enrollment and since it was taught by so many uh, different instructors. Um, the population I was most concerned about, obviously, are the students who are, as I say, first gen um, we certainly do get a lot of students who uh, are um, have a varied background, but for me, what I what I realized after I taught this for a few years was that many of our students are balancing a really, really tricky kind of uh, life to get through university here. Um, they many of them are married. They're to me they they all look way too young, but. Um, but married with children and a job outside of school, um, as well as trying to, to maintain uh, a full load of, of credits each semester. Um, they have many different sort of pulls on the money that they have available to them. Many of them are students who are here on uh, um, student loans, which of course I fully sympathize with. Um, many of them are, as I say, mostly paying for their school through uh, an outside job. Very few of them are funded by their parents. I mean, maybe about half, as I as I found out, uh, funded by parents. So, um, I I was concerned. the The one group that I do have do have in my class that is maybe a little bit different from uh, other places, since we're so close to Mountain Home, is that we have a lot of of students who are uh, from the military, either in the military currently or uh, have been in the military. They are paying for their school um, very often through the GI Bill or some sort of GI funding. This I have found through the semesters is not reliable on when those students would get it. So what I found happening was that many of our students would not have their funding at the beginning of the semester, not be able to buy their books right away. It would put them at a significant disadvantage as we uh, continued through the semester um, because you know they, they couldn't do the reading. And um, so this was another uh, very strong kind of impulse for me, the accessibility, the idea of having uh, readings for the students available immediately at no cost to them uh, as soon as the semester started. So that was another of the great sort of um, uh, impulses for me to create this, this text. Um, I put it together, as I say, probably over the summer, largely of 2016. We used it for the first uh, semester in 2017, 2018. And um, I made them, oh, sorry, I've got some kind of weird flash player thing here. Um, I had, um, I had, I, I found, what I found, one of my biggest challenges, we might talk about those later, but um, was finding material to use that's already uh, an open resource that I could repurpose. Um, and so in point of fact, I ended up writing most of this text to myself. It's still um, a text in flux, uh, and, um, and I can talk more about what I hope to do with it in the future. But th those were the populations that I was most concerned about. The students who were first generation, the students who had many, many uh, other uh, calls on their the sort of limited resources, and my, uh, my military students. 
Okay, and we do have a question in chat, and uh, I just want you to tease the answer now because I think you'll you'll give us a bigger answer uh, when we ask uh, some questions down the road. But Laura asks, um, with your OER including images of art, how did you deal with copyright? Oh, excellent question. Of all the of all the textbooks in all the world. Mine possibly was the one in which um, a copyright is going to be the, the biggest challenge. Um, and thank you for that question, Laura. I uh, absolutely will go into that in more detail. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping to do a, a, a course myself um, here this year. It was postponed because of, of the, um, you know, the pandemic, but um, on uh, so that I, I will know even more than I do now about copyright issues, but I will tell you all about that when I talk about um, how I actually built the book. All right, awesome, thank you, uh, Muppet. Okay, Teresa, can you kind of explain the why and what for for the creation of your OER text? Yes, and a lot of my reasons uh, echo Muffet, so I won't uh, kind of repeat all of that in terms of uh, student population. So the course I teach is a, um, uh, Anyone can take it, but it's a required course for theater uh, majors at Boise State. It's part of a three course sequence on theater history that they all take. Uh, I teach that course fully online or have done so for, for probably the past five or six years. Um, and I really started to um, you know, notice that students were, uh, well, it was kind of two things. One, being aware of student uh, financial and time struggles. And so wanting to be able to make the course as accessible as possible for students. Um, before switching to OER, I actually had two textbooks. So I had a history textbook as well as a play anthology book. So um, it could be up to um, you know, a few hundred dollars in textbook costs for that course. Uh, so that was part of it. And then uh, the other part of it was a, a combination of really thinking about what it is that I needed my students to learn in the course and whether the theater history textbook, as comprehensive and detailed as it was, you know, was really needed for that particular course. Um, and so uh, what Monica and I developed in working together through an OER grant that um, I received through Boise State was a combination of finding um, open access resource videos for students to get the kind of theater history portion of, of what I needed them to know, and then building um, a press books play anthology uh, for the plays that we would read so that students could have access to them um, at any time. So again, to Muppet's point, if they were working or somewhere caring for their children and had a few minutes to do some of their reading or do some of the work for the course, they had access to it right away as opposed to needing to carry their textbooks around with them all of the time. Um, so it was really a, a convenience financial as well as taking a look at um, what I really wanted my students to know and making different content choices based on that. Um, so those were really the factors that led me and the support that I was getting from Boise State through the grant to create the, the OER press book. Great, thank you. All right, Keith, you're up. And Keith, if you wouldn't mind, talk to not only why the book was created um, and who it's for, um, but anything else that, because Keith's book was in the works for quite some time before um, we were talking about OER. So Keith, you wouldn't mind kind of addressing that history as well. Okay, uh, the reason and, and again, uh, the same population uh, as far as students having textbooks and having to pay all the money for textbooks. But one of the purposes I, I, I wrote the book for uh, and wanted it to get published was being able to have easy information about the topic, anti-racism. And so I noticed that a lot of books wanted to make people experts in, in various aspects of uh, racial injustice. And I wanted to focus on people moving from non-racist to anti-racist, which was very important to me. And so I wanted to find a way to uh, uh, compiling all this information from uh, seminars that I've conducted from uh, lectures I've given over the years. And I decided to put this in an easy to read 100 page book that that people wouldn't have to uh, 
all these things are pub are, 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 are important when it comes to social injustice, but I wanted to focus on anti-racism. So getting with Bob, we uh, I got with him and I told him my desire to get this book published and, and he gave me an avenue on how to get it published and how I can get it into the hands of students. And again, it would not cost the students uh, very much money to, uh, no, not any money actually. And we came up with an, another way to make it uh, actually uh, monetarily advantageous to me. Uh, we found a way to get the book on Amazon, and uh, so I could I could make a few bucks along the way. So it was important that I get the message out, this easy message on on how to move from non-racist to an anti-racist individual. And we got the book published. It looks great. Um, we used the grant money, and we uh, did a lot of editing and. Uh, it's been uh, available since about, I think about June or, or something like, like that. And so uh, that's basically it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm happy it was done. Um, that's, that's how, it, that's about it. And I think I'd do better answering questions rather than trying to decide what people want to know. So we, you know, Laura seems to be really synced in on this particular um, panel. So I appreciate that, Laura. And she uh, asked a question just as you were answering it about uh, corporate publishing. And so the book is self-published through Amazon um, right now, um, as well as available to students through various means um, uh, like uh, press books and um, OER Commons. Um, and so if you wanted a hard copy, you could get a hard copy and then um, there's where Keith is compensated for his, his efforts through that mechanism. Um, the grant that Keith applied for was different than I think the grant that Teresa went through um, in that there was a very early grant through the Center for Teaching and Learning um, probably about a year before the State Board of Ed grants through the provost at Boise State came through. And so that's the grant that Keith used. Um, and actually uh, Keith, you know, bless his heart, took that grant money and, and went ahead and published or, or had some books printed. And so he has a set of books. The CTL has a set of books. And the goal, I think, at some point is to get those books distributed, um, whether through a workshop or through other some other means we haven't quite put it all together because, of course, as all of that was planning was happening, the pandemic hit. Yes, the Boise State Library uh, currently has um, one copy where we're kind of getting them, getting another signed copy to go into the um, uh, special collections uh, of, the, of the book. And then also working on getting a um, digital copy. Um, and it's again, something you can do through, through press books. And so I just wanna mention and, and call out Frederick Johnson, who was the OER GA over at the Idea Shop and the Center for Teaching and Learning it was really instrumental in, in helping putting this together. And, and just a little plug, Frederick will have his own panel um, on Friday, if you're interested to hear uh, his take on things. So at this point, um, um, we've talked about how it, how it came about, what student population you were looking to uh, address um, with the book. I'd like to ask, and I'm gonna go in reverse order, Keith, so get ready, um, <laughs> um, in that um, how um, is the book intended to be used in a teaching environment? Um, so if, if I'll let Keith go, just kind of explain whether it's in a classroom or in a seminar or a workshop, what would be the intent and how is that used? How is it used? You're muted, Keith. Okay, um, I would hope that the book would be used in the in the situation where, uh, as a supplement reading to in a course on that has to deal with uh, culture or race or any type of those courses, and that it'll be something that you can get from point A to point B, and and not a lot of times we don't finish textbooks in courses. We have certain chapters we read them, and I, I think this is an easy enough read. And the material is 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 uh, uh, interesting enough, and it's provocative enough that it can be g gone through in a weekend, and uh, that's what I hope to use in the in the classroom setting, so that uh, and 
with the fact that it would be free for students that they all could get a copy of it, whether it's digital or a hard copy so that they can always have that as a reference. As far as a seminar or, or, or some sort of workshop, uh, it, I, there's a workbook with it. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't put out the workbook, it's complete, it's done. Uh, it, where I can do a seminar, and I have done seminars using the book and the workbook that goes right along with it, and hoping that people will be able to um, grasp the information quickly, be able to write answers down in the workbook. So there's, there's, uh, my hope is that it's something that what I found is people's minds get bogged down in the topic of racism when all the aspects of racism, are, you are expected to know all of it. Um, we become an expert at, at Jim Crow. We want to become an expert at civil rights. We want to become an expert at slavery and all these things when really dealing with system, systemic racism, even though it's systematic, it's also within us. And so I hope the book can show a person how they can personally move from point A to point B on their own, which in turn, in the long run, helps the whole system move. And that's that's how I hope the book will be used. Great, thank you. Teresa, same question. So I, um, I think the, well, so the book is obviously has a use in the course itself in terms of the content for the students. Um, I think, the other way that we have been able to use it, and I think this crosses over to the question of kind of what were the challenges involved. So I'll kind of get into that a little bit too, because one of the great things about purchasing an already you know, created anthology of plays is that it comes with all this intro material about you know, providing students some context for the play and history of the playwright uh, and kind of a lens through which to read the play. And in, in compiling the, the plays that we did here, we were not able to do that. So the, you know, we kind of started with just the collection of plays in the in the press book um, open ed version. Uh, but actually Monica and I turned that into an opportunity for open pedagogy. So I adjusted my final project for the course um, so that students actually, as their final assignment, write an introduction to one of the plays um, that we read. And that it aligns well with the learning outcomes that I have about them understanding the historical context and being able to put plays, um, analyze plays based on, uh, you know, what the purpose of theater was in the time. And, and um, I've only had the textbook for two years, but after the first year, there were two of those play introductions uh, that we actually uh, chose to include. And then I got permission from the students to include as intro material in the textbook. Uh, and then I just finished this fall's course, obviously, and I'm going through that material to see what else we might be able to pull. So um, it's it's been able to turn into not just a, a place for content for the course, but also an, an educational opportunity for the students and a way for them to see their work um, being used going forward. So that's been really a great opportunity that this opened up for us. Great, thank you. Muffet, same question about how you're using the course and if you, or how you're using your we are text in the course and then i want you to pivot uh on then the creation of the book and specifically address the copyright issue for images you would use in the art book sure um well obviously we the the point of the book was to to create a, a textbook that could be used since since the material here is pretty um well we'll say um arcane in a way um, for most students and especially freshmen. I mean, you know, um, I had intended it to be the jumping off place for all of the work that we do in class. Um, not as a be all and end all, I would, I would lecture, but this would give the students a, a sort of a, a, an introduction to the topic for that week. So that's how it's been used. And, um, and, and also the, the idea was that by creating our own book like this, we would be able to um, tailor it going forward. Um, and I have done that. I, I'll talk about how I manage that. Um, but in any case, um, for each of the people who were teaching it, as I say, it had been in a sort of ad hoc fashion. Now we can keep it, um, um, people can, add things if they want to, things that are, uh, a lot of the people who teach this course with me 
are uh, fine artists in their own right. You know, I have a sculptor right now who's teaching the um, honors course. And so I want them to bring, you know, have the freedom to bring their expertise as, as well, obviously. So he, when he talks about things, he can, he, he can feel free to um, bring a little bit more to, to those sections. Um, how did how did she do it? Well, uh, it was a challenge, as I say. I'm sure Teresa uh, ha had a, a kind of equal uh, challenge, um, as did Keith. Uh, we've got um, my problem specifically was that it 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 hardly existed at all, as far as I could find um, in the OER uh, Commons or in the world. So. I found two resources that I was able to draw from. As I say, there were some chapters where I could use um, information. One was uh, Sailor Academy in California, and the other was the Boundless Lumen, which sort of, I think, has morphed into something else now. Um, so I used some of that, but rewrote a lot of that material as well, and then wrote my own chapters that I, you know, I my, my particular specialty is 18th and 19th century American art. So I just wrote that from scratch um, and, and adapted a lot of other stuff. So there was that, there was that. Now the issue of copyright is a really, really, that, that of course for us was the, the largest hurdle to get over, but not as bad as you might think because Many of the uh, periods that we talk about in, in art history have a great deal of material that is in the public domain. So you can make the points that you want to make um, by using things that ha already have a public domain license or a creative common license if you give credit, which we did, uh, you know, a share by license. Um, and so I, I found that there were very few uh, topics that I wanted to cover that I couldn't find an image somewhere that um, that had that had that kind of of open sort of already an open license. Now, when you get to the more modern material, it got more tricky. And for that material, I, gen I there are several occasions where I actually applied to um, the artists themselves or their galleries and got permission to use it in this for this educational purpose. Um, there I had to be real clear in the way we uh, referenced it in the text that it was uh, not to be used for any other purpose, that this particular image was not, you know, something that was open now commercially by any means. Um, but people were really very gracious about letting us use their work. Uh, so that was that was another uh, avenue that, that I explored. I, I was fortunate enough that I had I, I worked actually in uh, with art galleries throughout my weirdly my weirdly circuitous career. So um, I did know some people that I could talk to. Um, uh, but that was kind of the way the way that I approached that, and it wasn't as challenging as I think it might have been. My hope for the book going forward is that it will become um, a, a, a sort of what I was looking for in the beginning. And that is a sort of place where people can begin and then uh, bring their own resources and their own ideas um, to it so that it can be tailored for different populations and at different levels. So it doesn't always have to be uh, strictly uh, freshman art uh, appreciation. Although, you know, I've got lots of different level students, but still, um, that's the way it was projected. So hopefully that will, that will help. And I would be delighted to talk more about specific uh, uh, images or specific um, resources with Laura or anyone else who's interested um, at any point. So speaking of Laura, she does have a few questions for you. Oh. Um, so she wanted to know, you know, speaking of the copyright and using different images, uh, she did ask if if it if its focus on education helped, and you had more or less answered that that was one of the conditions that the people would let you use it. So did you? How did you? Was it just fair use? How did you attribute? Was there a license that you gave the piece that they let you use? How did that specifically work? 
Um, you know, I, I think I think probably not fair use. I think I, I was pretty clear about the copyright uh, remaining with the artist on on the things that I used. Um, so it was an educational use only. Uh, it could not be, m you know, manipulated in any way. So they couldn't fiddle with it. Couldn't be cropped. Couldn't be uh, changed in that way. Um, it it had to be a more restrictive. Um, and and in, as, as far as that, that's an interesting question and something I hope I'll know more about here shortly. Um, licensing specifically, um, I don't know if I actually licensed these things. I simply um, put as a requirement of, of use that it would follow these guidelines. I don't know if that actually uh, is a legal license. I don't know if it's the same license that uh, if, if you have to jump through any more hoops than that with say Creative Commons, but, um, but, um, but what I told the artists I would do and what I did do in the text was to be very, very clear about how this image could be reproduced, could be used going forward. Now that isn't true with a lot of the other images because as I say, they are fair use, they are public domain. Um, and those are not the same things, public domain and fair use. They are not the same thing. But, um, but uh, I did use both of those things actually um, in, in the text. N not so much fair use, because that's tricksy, but public domain is public domain. So I stuck with that as much as I could. The other place that I found lots and lots of really good in, um, images that I could use and sometimes adapt a little bit, uh, of course, was through Creative Commons. Uh, through uh, Wikipedia has, you know, good images that you can use and that give you lots of different choices for how, you know, what, what uh, size they are. And also then all you have to do is just be really sure that you're using the same Creative Commons license in terms of giving credit to the person who took the photo. Um, that is a, a weird sort of thing that we get into with art. And that is you have the art object that belongs to somebody somewhere. Um, if they're dead, that's good, um, actually, because then you, you know, that sort of restricts things. But, uh, but somebody may have taken a photograph of those. That's the place where you have to be really careful about giving attribution to, um, to the person who actually took that photograph of that art object. I don't know. Does that, is that, does that make sense? Is that helpful? I, I think so. She also asks if this made publishing it online um, make the copyright more, was it more complicated? Did you have to tell them my intent is to, to distribute this online? I know you don't have a print version of the book, but that might be coming. Yeah. So does that impact any of these agreements? Um, you know, uh, it might do. And I think in point of fact, if I did want to do something like what Keith did, um, I would probably need to go back to those people. And um, because the agreement was, I would not be benefiting from their work. If anybody were to benefit from the work, it should be them, obviously. Um, so uh, at this point, I think that might come up uh, down the road if that were an issue. For me, right now, it's not. I mean, I um, it it's 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 serving the purpose that I anticipated it would. Um, I I didn't have an expectation of um, of any kind of, I mean, I, I, I certainly got lots of financial uh, help from the Hewlett Foundation and, um, and the university as well, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, so I was fine with that, but, but I think that's an excellent point. And I think it's certainly something that I will have to consider more fully if in fact I did want to publish it. Right now it's in press books. And I think in press books through, um, through the commons, um, it's available to anybody who wants to use it as I did. I don't think it would be available to anybody who wanted to use it in a more financially, you know, sort of specific way. Okay, so um, we have roughly 20 minutes left and I wanted to, even though we've been answering questions, uh, open it up even broader to anybody who has um, any type of other questions about the books, how they're used in the courses, how they came about. Um, and then I don't want to not mention that uh, Muffet also um, did some research on the efficacy of her OER text. And I'll share that in the, the whole report in the chat as well. She co-authored with Rob Nyland 
um, um, and it's a really interesting, and it's the first time, I think, Muffet, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the first time Boise State has had any uh, research published on the use of an OER text in a Boise State course. Um, and so it's, there's some really interesting things in there. Do you have anything to say about that, Muffet? Yes, yeah, that uh, that was a really I didn't I didn't create the book with that in mind with that research project in mind, but um, after having attended a couple of conferences, I realized that it was kind of a uh, an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. So uh, through the school, I put together um, a little bit. I mean, it was it's a small study, and it was it was just that first semester. I think we might do something more here in the future. Rob was my uh, charts guy because art, not math. Um, and so he did he did that part of it for me, um, all the statistics and so on. And I have to say that there were some surprises. There really were, um, uh, some not, obviously. It wasn't a surprise that everybody appreciated that they didn't have to pay for the textbook. Good, um, that was not a surprise. What was a surprise to me though, was the percentage of students in that year who would ad admit, and I will grant you that it was a completely blind um, study. I didn't, there was no linkage to any particular student and the students were assured that their names would never be you know, made public. Um, but how many of them would admit to the fact that for, uh, and I do have the statistics here, I just don't think I, think I can share my screen. I don't know. Uh, I, I could show you a, a chart. But the fact was that a, a percentage of them admitted to never buying the textbook for a course that they were taking. Never, never buying it, never reading it. Now, I could understand that there might be certain courses where you could get by, you know, sort of by the seat of your pants. But for me, that was always the thing I wanted to do. And so I was just surprised by that. I was surprised. Others might not be, but I was surprised. Um, the other thing that I was concerned about and that I, that I wanted to sort of pull the students on was how they felt about it, how they felt about this textbook, which was free. Because sometimes, you know, um, there was the potential for some students to feel that free equals not as good. That if they don't have to pay for it, they're not getting the value that they might've gotten from another resource that they actually had to pay money for. Um, interestingly, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't so much the case. They seemed to be okay with this particular textbook. Um, and then I think finally the idea was um, that, um, uh, that I wanted to find out if they had, uh, uh, you know, liked it. <laughs> did they like it? I mean, do they did they feel that this this book gave them um, was a useful addition to their education? Um, and again, I had a primarily positive feedback uh, on that on that issue. So, by and large, I think what we did get just a preponderance of the responses um, and the and the the data that we did were able to recover um, seemed to indicate that an OER textbook in this field, and I'm sure it, it's in many other fields, uh, but there were so few in the arts generally that um, that I could say with a certain amount of authority that we need to do more of this, that there needs to be more um, you know, work done in the liberal arts. Mostly when I was doing this work, what you could find were textbooks for STEM courses. We need more in the liberal arts. And Teresa's, you know, is fabulous in social, uh, social issues. Uh, Keith's is beyond fabulous. And so, you know, this was one of the things that I came away from it from, with, the idea that this is a, a really important sort of discipline or sort of cluster of disciplines that OER can slide into in a really efficacious way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we do have something in the, in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in just a moment. So thank you, Laura, but Teresa, so and Keith as well, we'll, we'll, we'll go in that order. Um, can you talk about how your text was received by the students? Mm -hmm. I know you didn't, 
maybe not yet, but maybe do some research in the future. I know Keith and I have brushed on that topic briefly. I don't know about Teresa, but maybe you and Monica could do some research, but how have you, what was your perceptions of the book um, and how, what have the students said about it? Um, yeah, I, um, so we did actually, I worked with Monica and Ben to, to try to do some, some research. Unfortunately, the semester that we did that, we got very low uh, response rate from the students, but Monica actually, Monica and I are actually presenting at the teaching conference um, in June about the work that we did on this book. Um, and hopefully in the future, we, we were thought maybe we'd redo it this past fall and decided enough things were happening. So maybe we'll look at it again for next fall. Um, anecdotally though, um, students have responded very favorably to it. Um, and I think both the combination of um, uh, the not having to pay for the textbook, I certainly the first semester I did it heard from a variety of students that were so happy that they didn't have to pay for a textbook for the course. Um, they've actually really been enjoying the videos that I've been using um, for the theater history portion. And then um, I think they like this idea that they might get to contribute to the text going forward through the work that they're doing. Um, so, so in general, I've gotten really positive response um, to that. I also saw there was a question in the chat that I'll just address quickly related to how we integrated it into the LMS. Um, so uh, we actually just built a link directly into the LMS to go to the press book. Um, and then in each little section, I'd also just do a little mini link to the particular part so students could get at it from that place in the LMS where it said, read this thing, read this play next, or uh, through the main menu, they could access the press book overall. I'll be interested to hear um, how, what uh, the transition to Canvas, if that might open up some additional opportunities for um, embedding the press book in there. All right, thank you. And Keith, can you talk about how your book has been received and not only the, you know, for use in a course, um, but uh, you've also had some feedback from uh, people who have purchased the book, uh, the hardcover, uh, print on demand version, um, but you've had a couple of newspaper articles and other things about the book as well. Can you touch on those as well? Well, I, most of what I have to say will deal with uh, outside the classroom because we, to my knowledge, uh, not a lot of people have used the book in the classroom, at least that I know of, but the people that have bought the book, and I used the book in the seminar uh, before the pandemic started, I used the material because the book wasn't done. But what I've gotten is exactly what I wanted. People thought it was an easy way to understand a difficult situation or a complicated situation. Uh, dealing with race is never an easy thing, uh, but you can put information in in a certain way that makes it so that individuals could feel more comfortable in dealing with the topic. And that was the whole goal of the book, is not to, to hit people over the head with guilt, not to hit people over the head with so much information that they uh, lose track of what what, what I'm trying to do. And the overwhelming response has been that it was easy to read and easy to understand, and they could see themselves uh, moving, that they had to move from that non-racist, uh, uh, comfortable place to becoming an anti-racist, which is a less comfortable place to be. And that's what I was proud of, is the fact that, okay, I accomplished my goal. There are plenty of books out there that are better at teaching you about civil rights. There are plenty of books that are better at teaching you about um, uh, Jim Crow or slavery. My goal was to like I said, move a person from that non-racist, stagnant place to become an anti-racist individual that actually did something. And I, I wanted to show them how, and the response, that has been the response. And whether it sells a uh, hundred or a thousand or a million, just hearing that people are, it, it's doing what I wanted it to do. That's what I dreamed of it doing. And, and hopefully the university people will, in the university who need this type of a, a book will, will, will sooner or later catch on to it. But that's, that's been the response is that it's been a easy to read and it's been information that people never thought of before. And it's been helpful for moving somebody from point A to point B. 
Uh, right, and I will say this too. I happen to know that it's being considered for one of the UF 200, which is a, an ethics type of a class here at Boise State. Um, not and not in every UF 200 because there's different themes and 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 disciplines to go with that course. But there's been some interest, and in, and in, and so I think that maybe as early as the fall, it'll be ready to take some of that material uh, from the book and implement it into the course. Um, and uh, so there, the, I know there is interest, um, but like I said, the book just got pushed out. Faculty are, are just barely finding out about the book. Um, and so there is some interest there. Um, so we have a, another question from Laura. Um, it says, how did the students, how did you have the students interact with the text um, and each other? Um, did you use online discussion forums, Zoom or in person? I think that's to everybody, uh, not just to Keith necessarily. Well, I'll let Keith, if Keith has an answer, but otherwise I had a thought. Well, I did, I did a lot, a lot of in class, in session type uh, activities where, uh, where we read something from the material and then we do something that explains that in which we read. And so I like the hands-on. I like being able to, uh, and having done this for, so long, there, there are several uh, oh, scenarios, for lack of a better term, that I add into uh, a session or a class that will push the point that the student has read about. And now they can actually see that work with other students or themselves in a, in a, in a classroom setting or a seminar setting. Um, and I'm actually really um, happy that this question got asked because it reminds me that I left out another important feature and another great uh, bonus of having this um, online uh, textbook and play anthology is that actually Monica and I also work to integrate and working with Ben Croft to integrate hypothesis um, into it. So this was a couple of years ago uh, before Boise State was doing the official pilot um, so we actually then built in activities where the students are doing annotations, particularly I'm asking them to kind of take the historical context piece that we learned first and then make comments and notes about where their that understanding is helping them within the play. Um, so it's actually been a really useful because it's an online text and they can use that tool to do that. Um, it's provided a learning opportunity that I was having trouble getting at before really helping the students make the connection between how does what we learned about the historical context appear in how we're reading the play? Uh, so that's another really useful uh, side effect of making the switch to the OER textbook. It's a great idea. Um, well, you know, um, I did teach with this text uh, in a, in face to face classes first. So uh, now apparently it's going to be just an online class going forward, but. Um, with 150 students, uh, a whole lot of exchange, you know, is a little difficult. Um, I, the class was made, or the text was made available even before it was in press books, chapter by chapter, um, on Blackboard. And, um, and you can do the same thing, by the way, in Canvas. It's, it's a little more cumbersome in Canvas, but what, whatever, whatever. Um, and so the students had to do a very short, low stakes reading quiz based on the material in the written, in the, in the text. Um, and then there is an assignment that I have them do of some sort. Um, now that we're online, there's a discussion board. So they do interact with each other in groups uh, according to the material from the text because like you, Teresa, I have, uh, I'm more, you know, this is art history, it's history by way of objects. So um, the cultural context is kind of crucial. And that's the hardest thing for the students to grasp. It's not, I mean, anybody can describe a thing um, without any kind of background at all. But the point of the OER text is to give them that historical background so they understand the object better. And um, so in the uh, discussion board and in the assignments, my goal, my you know, learning objective is always to try to get them to understand uh, how this object reflects the culture of the moment. 
So basically, I would say that's what we did. We did have some very good conversations about some of these objects in um, in class when we were face to face. Um, you know, I'm they're not we're not able with 150 to do uh, very efficient you know effective zooms um, in the course. So it pretty much is all restricted to what you can do in Blackboard um, now. But we'll see how that goes. But I love the, uh, I, I've got so many ideas myself uh, just today from the things that uh, you are doing in class, Teresa, and also uh, the things that you have done, Keith. And so um, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for ways to try to incorporate more active learning stuff into the, into whatever it is we're doing. And I'm going to, you know, continue to make that effort. All right, well, thank you. We have just about a minute left. So I wanna give the speakers one more chance to kind of get something out that they have uh, to say. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and, and start that off with Keith. So if you have something you wanna say to close it up. Well, the only thing I would do is encourage these ladies to get their books in hard copy so they can get an autographed copy to me. Uh, I, I love having autographed copies from people who write their own books. I think that's really cool. Uh, the other thing is that it's, it's uh, I'm just glad that this avenue is available uh, to students and that uh, they're not, it's saving students a ton of money and it's, and I think that's just cool. Teresa, thank you, Keith. Um, I'll just reiterate that I, again, though I don't have the, the awesome research data that, that Muffet has at this point, uh, I have certainly found that uh, my students have appreciated the switch. It hasn't affected the, um, if anything, it's potentially you know, improved student engagement with the material. Um, and so from a learning perspective, um, it's been a, a great opportunity to um, still get the same information to students in a way that's more accessible to them. So I would encourage folks, Muffet's right, that um, the challenge, particularly in the arts, was finding something pre-existing, which we were not able to do, which is why Monica and I had to work together to make one. So uh, I encourage all people who teach arts courses to, uh, to get on the OER bandwagon so there's more material that's available for people to draw from in the future. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just gonna leap in since time is short and say all of that I uh, second for sure. And um, um, I, I totally encourage everybody to, to make an effort on some, even if it's starting with something small, like a, a given uh, topic and do something there and then move out from that. Um, I would just like to say that uh, my personal feeling is this is the wave of the future. I was one of those uh, students who, who came to university from, um, let's say, a, a, a demographically challenged background. And so if there had been this kind of resource available to me as a student, it would have made a huge difference. So I'm sure that my passion for it comes from a, a sort of place of personal, you know, um, um, experience, I guess. But I, I thank everybody who has been here today. And I hope if I can answer any questions going forward, please, please feel free to email me. All right. Thank you all, uh, all our, our panelists. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and share. There's lots of people saying thank you and how great the discussion was. And I agree. Um, and um, I will just say on behalf of the panelists, if you want to reach out to us, um, we're available via, I think, email contact information on the conference website. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Bob and everyone. And I'll just quickly add, thanks for joining us today. If you want to check out our on-demand content, I've posted the link in the chat. There are really great recorded sessions there. And if you missed anything earlier this week that you wanted to see, we will be posting recordings of those sessions as well very shortly on YouTube. So keep an eye out for that. Um, thanks for joining us. Hope to see you tomorrow.